for our short meditation, um, I would like to turn your attention to the book or the gospel, Luke, gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verses 33. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, verse 33. It says like this. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for this word, verse you have given to us, our Father. As we are going to meditate on these words together, Lord, speak to us. It's not necessarily speak to all of us through me or not. We want you to speak to each one of our heart directly so that we will understand the way, the manner you loved us, O oh Father. So we take this opportunity to submit ourselves before you and open our spiritual eyes, spiritual ears, and our heart so that we can hear from you yes, and help us to obey all that you say to us and do your will in our life, O oh Father. Bless us together. In Jesus' name we do pray. The word says like this, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. So today we will be discussing about the cross, about the three crosses. That is what we can see on the Mount Calvary, exactly the location or place called Golgotha, which is in Aramic, or if you just to say the place called the skull. So, so we will be discussing about that. Although the synoptic gospels and the uh, John's gospel narrate the crucifixion and about uh, the two thieves who crucified with Jesus, Luke could go a little more further and very specifically highlight the comments of the two thieves regarding his, their understanding about Jesus. Now, it's not about us. It is not that who worship the living God. It is who he is. Because he is worthy of all our praises. He is worthy of all our worships. He, worthy, he is worthy of all our honor, respect, everything. Because he has given us life. And that is why we are here today. So, just I want to focus on these three crosses. What Dr. Luke says about that and how he analyzed and he come, how did he come up with the statements of these you know, criminals who were crucified one on the right side and one on the left side. Being, Luke, being a Gentile convert, was the only non-Jewish author of, of a Bible book. He was a medical doctor, well-educated and skillful writer, a historian and a theologian. The book is written to Theophilus, which means one who loves God. That's it's an individual, you know, he's especially writing to that individual, and his na name is Theophilus, which means one who loves God. Matthew's gospel is written mainly for the Jewish Christians. Mark's gospel was short and written for the Christians in Rome. But the rest of the world, especially the Greek-speaking Christians, did not have the gospel in a written form. They have, a, you know, you know, part of the gospel preached or shared or brought down through the uh, through his through his servants and preached time to time or shared in the congregation or with individuals. But other than that, they did not have a solid book to be called as their, you know, to call as a book and follow the teachings of that book. So, in the light of such situation, Luke's writings mainly focus to give a complete account regarding Christian faith, especially of Christ's genealogy, birth, life, and ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension, which we can see in the gospel according to Luke. Then we can see the coming of the Holy Spirit, beginning and expansion of the Christian church, which is mentioned in the book of Acts of the Apostles. So, you now Luke is narrating the Yonder event. We can find the same event in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
and also in the gospel according to John. But you know, uh, 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 Luke is trying to pull some more you know, information regarding a person, like a little more deeper information, so that uh, you know, the Gentile world will understand that the people, those who are not belongs to the, the Jewish community who became Christian, but also other people who are living outside the gender world and who became Christian, and for that they need to have a, a elaborated and explained way of you know, gospel. So that is why he is writing the gospel according to Luke. So we can understand that you know, you know, that this book is one of the best book. You know, you can find the most history, and because he was one of the historians, and uh, uh, so he is giving little more emphasis for this event, the crucifixion event. You know, then he said that you know, uh, books three and four, four gospels say crucified along with the criminals, but here it says uh, one, one on the right and one on the left, and again, the conversation continues. Sometimes we stop there, but you know, Luke wanted to communicate that to the Gentile, to the Gentile Christians, especially Greek-speaking Christians. What is the meaning of cross? You know, we know that, we all know cross. We are not going to uh, etymological study, but you know, just to know, that cross is used during the early years of a Roman you know, uh, uh, kingdom, in the Roman kingdom, to punish or to hang all the people, those who commit sin, or, or they, those who are not going according to the, the set laws of the Roman kingdom. So they use that. So this is just to show to the public other people that you know, if anybody commit a sin, a wrongdoing, this will be the punishment so that people will be afraid, afraid of that one, so they will, you know, keep away from that kind of situation. So then other things, different people have different, for Christians, many Christians, especially nominal Christians, what do they do? They have, a, they, they use cross as a symbol of their identity. Now, when I was going to, I was growing up in a, in a Jacobite church, uh, my mother's side and my father's side, Marthoma Church, we, we, we had a you know, small, we had a chain, a golden chain. Under the chain, now, there will be a cross attached to that one. By seeing that cross, people know that uh, this person is a Christian. So that's the way we used it. In those, I'm talking about many years ago. Nowadays, you may not find that one. The cross shape changed on different kinds of crosses come. But maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was different. They make a very nice you know, cross on the tip of that, you know, that chain. And we know that it is the, sometimes when we go to college, we put that one outside so that people will see the gold chain we are wearing, things like that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's announced our identity. Our identity, identity is what? We are a Christian. The cross, you know, shows that we are a Christian. So that's what. But on the other hand, when you think about the cross from the perspective of God. You know, cross is a symbol of love. Cross is a symbol of love. We can see when we read John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. When we read that part, we can understand this way. We know, almost everybody knows that was by heart. John, Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verse 16. It says like this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send, that is verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is the ultimate purpose of Christ's coming, placing him on the cross of Calvary, and when he cried out for help, Father turned away his face. And waited. The ultimate goal is that to save, not to condemn you, not to condemn me, not to condemn the world, but at least through that, you know, event, that crucifixion event, let others also come into the saving knowledge of Christ or, or as, a, as, a, as a children of, you know, God. That's from the perspective of God. Then on the other hand, we can see that cross is a symbol of shame sometimes. 
You know, it is very sad for a criminal to hang on the cross on a mountainside so that everyone in that village will see who is hanging on that cross and what kind of mistake he has committed. So that's the kind of shame. Nobody wants that. We like to tell about other people, but we don't want anybody to tell about our own stories. If I tell my story to somebody, I told something to somebody, I always present myself as a good guy, right? Good person. We never say we are bad and the other person is good. We always say we are good, but that person is very bad. So if we don't talk, we, don't, we can avoid that kind of things. So it's a, the cross was a symbol of shame. Hanging on the cross, you know, people are, everybody will watch over him and they will, you know, they will hate them. Not only them, they are going to die anyway, but their family. They don't want, nobody want to, you know, make a friendship relationship with that particular family because of this shame has come in. So cross sometimes stands as a symbol of shame. And also cross is a symbol of suffering. You know the way they, they crucify the criminals. They nail them. They leave them like that. After some time, the time passes, you know, the nail, the huge nail, because of the weight of the body, the body will, you know, come, you know, hang out, hang down. Then, you know, so much pain all over. You can see so much bleeding, so much suffering. You know, Jesus Christ was, you know, imagining about this kind of suffering when he was sitting and sharing his meal, the last supper with his, you know, disciples. And he told that, uh, you know, something is going on in me. I cannot tolerate that anymore. A bad feeling. He told that uh, after this meal, we are going to go to the Mount of Olives. We are going to pray that place. Then he prayed, you know, he kneeled down and there and prayed that the pain, the suffering. He told the Father, if possible, remove this cup from me. That much pain. He imagining and he's getting that, that pain. When we think about his human side of life. So it's a symbol of suffering. Then we can see the cross is a symbol of death. Jesus died on the cross. The thieves died on the cross. And whoever the Roman soldiers hangs on the cross, they will be died. It's a symbol of death. If they didn't die, they will come and break them, and they will die ultimately. That's the end. There, nobody comes back from that crucifixion scene, or from the cross. Nobody has ever come back. Yes. Ultimately, you know, like, like immediately or slowly, they die. So it's the cross symbolizes the uh, symbolize death. And also, cross is a symbol of sacrifice. And in the case of Jesus, that was a sacrifice. In the case of criminals, that is the punishment. So cross also stands as a you know, symbol of you know, a sacrifice. On the other hand, when we see the death of Christ on the cross. And after three days of his resurrection, we can see that that cross stood as a symbol of victory. Cross stands as a symbol of victory. When we read Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, you know, there is a talk. It says like this. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seal because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests, kingdom and priest to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. So in that case, when we see Jesus Christ died but resurrected on the third day, that shows that Jesus Christ have overcome the death. You know, we read elsewhere in the Bible, we read, oh, death, where is your sting? Where? He is there. He is standing there and telling. He defeated death. He defeated the hell. Defeated Satan. Defeated everything and coming and standing. And you hanged him on the cross. But now he stands. That cross stands as a symbol of victory. And which the same cross stands as a symbol of hope. Today, when we see the cross, we are not afraid of that cross. Any cross. 
Yes, we know that we know. The immediate, the moment we see a cross, immediately it, our memory, you know, travels, you know, takes our, you know, our imagination through Christ to the eternity. We know that. That's the way we are going to do. When we read, you know, the, the pilgrim's progress, there is a question. There is a way that the Christian is seeing a, a, a dream, and he is going, and he, the way he is going, at the end, the, the way closes there. No more way to God. But he can see a cross they're standing. And through the cross, he's entering into the next level of life. That is what our future hope. So in that perspective, cross stands as a symbol of hope. Today, that is why I thought, let us talk about cross. Sometimes we don't, we don't talk. We know about all about cross, but sometimes we don't talk. But there are many other people, you, you may hear many other you know, sim, you know, symbol, you know, symbols of cross. You know, sometimes you know, you know, there may be many, but still few to highlight I just wanted to share. So let us come back to the passage where there is three individuals are crucified on the Mount of Olive, sorry, uh, the, the Mount of Calvary at the place called the Skull, Golgotha in Aramic, they say. They say that like, when they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one, one on the right on, on the other side. So let us see this. Let us closely examine a little bit about these three people. This, you know, the cross, the cross that Jesus is hanging, the cross that one, you know, uh, criminal is hanging, and the other crosses that other criminal is hanging. Let us see. Let's read uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 39. 23, verse 39. It says like this. One of the criminals who hung there, hurled insult at him, means Jesus, are in you the Christ, save yourself and us. That is the understanding of one criminal, one on the right side, one, I read on the right side or left, they just mentioned just one criminal, one of the criminal, he just thought that, uh, you know, we, you know that the procession was going on along with Jesus, this, maybe other two people or maybe several other, we don't know, but these other two people are, you know, criminals are also going, they know that they are going to be hanged or crucified along with Jesus. And they may have some bad, you know, like, like wild expectation. What is that? They heard about Jesus. There's Jesus do many miracles. Who knows? Jesus may escape from that situation. And when he escapes, he might help us also so that we can also escape from that, that situation, that, from the hanging on the cross. And maybe he waited some time, this one criminal, he waited some time. But nothing happened. Jesus is also going through pain. They are also going through pain. Then finally, he maybe, who knows, perhaps he could not control. You know, then he start, opened his mouth and he started to speak, you know, kind of thing. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insult at Jesus. Aren't you Christ? Save yourself and us first. This, we are going to die here. And uh, we name, we, let us name that cross as the cross of a rebellion or cross of a reproach. He is going to the same situation. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He is also going through the same pain. It's not only his body is paining, his soul also grieving. His you know, you know, you know, his soul spirit also grieving. Jesus is in, in, a, in a full fully going through the pain. In that situation, this man is asking, this criminal is asking, You are Christ. You preached so many times, you can do miracles, you can do many things. But now is the time to show your power, the power of your miracle. You do one thing. You save yourself and save us also. The cross of a rebellion. Even though he is hanging on the cross, even though he is at pain, even though he knows the situation, but still he always blames Jesus blamed Jesus Christ, or he heard insult on Jesus Christ, saying that uh, you are Christ, you are Jesus, you save yourself first and save us also, so that we can come out of this situation. Just imagine, same cross, three people 
hanging on it. One person is even then, even though he's going through so much painful situation, still he is trying to find a fault with, you know, the Lord who is, you know, hanging next to him. He's trying to save yourself and save us also. We want to be saved. We want to be run. I cannot take any more this pain. He said, save yourself. Save us also. That represents as a cross of a rebellious mentality or a reproach. He is ready to pour any kind of report, insults on other people. Then we can see, again, verses 40 and 41. Chapter 23, verses 40 and 41. It says like this, But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserves. But this man has done nothing wrong. He's an innocent person hanging on the cross because of somebody hurled issues on him because maybe the, 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 the called chosen group, the Pharisees or maybe the Sadducees or the scribes or the teachers of the law or the priest you know, somebody, you know, you know blamed him and that is why he is suffering here. He did not go through did, did, he has done no wrong at all. He's an innocent person and you are a criminal who committed mistake. That is why you are hanging here and suffering. Now you don't fear God. You are simply blaming let us label that cross as a cross of repentance or remorse. He knows that he is going to die. There is humanly thinking, there is no point of repenting that moment. But still, see the way he is working. The way he is thinking. Similar two people. One is criminal, one criminal is accusing Jesus Christ. Save yourself and save us also. And the other criminal is telling that uh, you are accusing him. He is an innocent guy. You got this punishment because you are, did deserve this punishment. You don't fear God. Thieves also fear God. He's a good thief. He's thief, but he's a good thief. Right? And you know, some, when, you, when you study uh, the, you know, some of the uh, Christian writings in the early centuries, maybe first century or you know, second century, you know, time like that, uh, you know, when we read, there are many uh, books. We have this is uh, like 66 books, but when you take Roman Catholic books, Bible, they have 72 books. Then you take further, you go, like there are several pseudographical books and many other things. Uh, and one of such book, book called The Gospel According to Nicodemus. Gospel according to Nicodemus. We know the Nicodemus story in the, in, the, in the Bible. You know, gospel according to him. He later on found out the names of, because he is working in the, in the inner circle, in the government. So he got the names of these people, the two thieves. One, they said that the good thief, the, the thief who repented, uh, his name is Gustus. And also the other thief's uh, name is uh, uh, Gestus, uh, no, sorry, the, the one who, the good team, uh, thief's name is Dismas, and uh, the bad team, uh, thief's name is Gestus. And they have, you know, when you go to Roman Catholic Church, in, in South America especially, you can find Saint Dismas statue. They adore, they worship, because, you know, he, he was a good guy. So he told, you know, and, uh, he, he, he was a little kind to Jesus Christ. So he is also venerated as one of the saints. And when we see, read, Jesus, when Jesus looked at this person, you know, see, Jesus is in the middle, one on the right, one on the left. The one of these people said that, uh, you are Christ, you save yourself and save us. And the other person, the other thief told that, uh, you know, you don't fear God. You know, you deserve, you, you, you are going through this situation because you deserve it, you need deserve it. But this man, you know, this man, he did not, he's an innocent. He did not do any harm, any, he did not do any wrong at all. And you're still blaming, you don't fear God. That's why you are blaming this way. 
Then, this, this good thief turned to Christ and told, when we read verse 42, it says like this. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There is no point of repenting at that moment because in any seconds they will, he will die. But still, without losing his hope, without giving up his expectation, even though he is a thief, he is telling that when you come into your kingdom, in your glory, remember me. He doesn't want to continue with this kind of, you know, stealing stuff. You know, he doesn't want to be a you know, bad guy in this society because maybe his life situation forced him to do this act, maybe stealing. We don't know. But still, he was looking, from this statement, we can understand one thing that he was looking forward for the coming of the Messiah and establishing the kingdom of God on this earth in the line of, you know, King David. And so that he doesn't need to do any stealing. He doesn't need to, you know, harm anybody. But he can also have identity as a child of Abraham or as children of God. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom of God. A few weeks ago, we heard about, you know, that during the Christmas season, we heard the message from Pastor, our pastor, dear pastor, you know, shared about the, you know, you know, you know uh, prophetess uh, Anna and also the uh, uh, other, you know, devout person, righteous person called Simeon. When they saw the baby Jesus coming into the temple for the dedication, they took that baby Messiah, baby, baby Jesus in their hand, then they glorified God in the same way they were looking, they were, you know, all their life they were looking forward for that particular day. Then both of them testified that now we are ready to go away for our rest, the eternal rest. <laughs> See, look at this person. This thief is telling that he's also, I'm, I'm guessing he was also looking forward at the day that is, you know, going to come. So he realized on the cross of Calvary, Maybe he did not follow Jesus Christ when he was doing his ministry and calling disciples and doing all kinds of stuff. He did not you know, give much heed. But now he realized that he is the Messiah. So he told that, Jesus, when you come in your glory, in your kingdom, please remember me. Jesus, hanging on the cross, told him, Luke chapter 23, verse 40, 43, it says like this. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That's it. Today, right now, he knows that they are going to die here. After within most, within few seconds, they know that they are going to die. So Jesus, very, very, you know, very you know, strongly, very you know, you know, confidently, he told that today, right today, when you die, you will be with me in paradise. We know that when Jesus dies, he's going to go to the paradise. When these people die, they go to the paradise. So today, you thief. You confessed a yeah, true repentance. Jesus, if Jesus is in the, in the other, other time, he will say, he, you are the true descendant of Abraham. But now he told it, today you will be with me in paradise. So he is going to go with Jesus Christ because of that true repentance. Even though it's the last minute, there's no hope. But still, without losing that little slight hope, he put one word with Jesus. Just one word. When you come into your glory, when you, you know, rule your kingdom, remember me. That's all. Jesus told her, why should I wait for, why should I wait for that day? Now, today, you are coming with me. That's why Paul said paradise in the sense is like a heaven only. You know, Paul said that I know one person who went up to the third heaven. And again, following verse, he says that, I know, I, he was taken into the paradise. That is this paradise where God is preparing for all the God's children. Jesus told that, today, you will be with me in paradise. On, let us title that cross as a cross of redemption. Cross number three. The cross of redemption. Cross of rebellion or reproach. We can be anything. We can do that. Cross of repentance or remorse. Even without losing that heart, 
Just one word, Jesus. Jesus, help me. That one word saved him. He saw that he admitted his life when he called, Jesus, remember me. That means he humbled himself. He surrendered and told that I cannot do anything. You don't need to do anything now. You don't need to save yourself. You don't need to save us. You don't need to do anything. But I know one day you are going to rule this world. You are going to establish your kingdom. That day, remember me. Jesus said, why should I wait? Why should I wait that day? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. That shows, that, that if you title that cross as a cross of redemption or a repossession, cross of a repossession. See, do look at Jesus Christ. He is hanging on the cross. Very painful situation. But still, Jesus did not, you know, his, his, his inner being is so peaceful, so calm, so nice. He did not get angry with them. He has every right to get angry, right? Because he's going through pain. If a little headache you have, if our child comes twice or thrice, we will definitely throw him out. Definitely we will get angry. You don't give me peace. You don't let me rest. You don't do anything. But look at Jesus Christ. The pain that he's going through. Not only his body, but in his spirit and his soul. Everywhere. Pain. The pain is that father for, turned his face away. That is a you know, big shot for him. He knows it, but still humanly thinking, that was a big shock for him. And the pain, the nail, one nail here, one nail here, one nail on the leg, you know. Then on top of that, the, the, the girl with the spear, they pierced him it's all over, thirsty. Isaiah 55 verse, sorry, 53 verse 5 says like this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. If anybody is boasting today that we are somebody, we are healed by our power, by our material possession, by anything that, that we have, that's absolutely wrong. Isaiah, before Jesus' death, even birth, 700 years ago, he already declared how this Jesus is going to, you know, save, going to suffer, going, going, going to suffer, going to die. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. If we continue to live our life in the past, past life, Again, every day we are crucifying Jesus. Every day the big nail is hitting. Each time when we do some mistake, it's hitting the, that big nail. He's going through pain that time, each time. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus' situation is different. He's going through a lot of pain on the cross. But still, all these people did not leave him alone. He, they all insulted, starting from, from his own people. When we think about that, we can see, uh, when we read Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 31, we can see that, you know, Pilate, and he was a governor, that his, he and his soldiers, you know, mocked at Jesus. Then we can see, when he was hanging on the cross, you remember, people were passing through the road from outside, going from market or wherever they're passing through. They all looked at him. You are standing, you are hanging there. If you're son of God, come out of there and save yourself and save everybody. The chief priest and the teachers of the law, the one who knows the law very well, the one who translates the word, the one who writes very well, the scribes, the people, those who teach every Sabbath day in the, in the temples. They told him, you are suffering now. You are hanging on the cross. You said you are a Christ. Come down. What will happen? You save yourself, and we also will believe in you. Then we can see Herod and his soldiers. Luke chapter 23, verse 11. Then the ruler sneered at Jesus Christ when he was hanging on the cross. 
then this finally, this criminal is telling that you are Jesus, you are Christ, save yourself and save us also. It's very painful, but save. You try this time. And they're putting all kind of, this kind of insult on Jesus Christ. Still, Jesus is just hanging. He's listening everything, but no response from him. We know that in the previous time when people, you know, in the, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the business people came and uh, did business in his temple, in Father's house, uh, he came and whipped the people, those who were selling and uh, buying. He got angry, but now look at him. He's on the cross, not, not, not reacting. When the, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law and all that did not understand the interpretation of the scripture, the law, Jesus told you, are you know, brutes of vipers. He got angry. But now, this Jesus is lying down so peacefully on the grass. We you know that several others also got angry. You know, Moses, he got angry. He killed one slave. He killed one Egyptian. Next day, he came to solve the problem between two Jewish people, but, uh, you know, then he has to run away. Remember, when he was on Mount Pisgah, God testified about him. He is the meekest man. He told Miriam and, Ar Miriam and Aaron, you know, you talk against my servant Moses. I speak to, to people through prophets, through dreams, through visions, through, you know, revelations, through nature, through, you know, sound, all kinds of ways. But when I talk to my servant Moses, I talk to him face to face. Before he encountered that Yahweh, he was very rough. He killed one person with one slab. But now he's telling, he was, so many times he was ridiculed Moses in the wilderness, throughout the wilderness, you brought us here to die. We had enough food there. We had everything there, but now nothing is there. You brought us out of that place from plenty, and you brought us here and to die here. He did not open his mouth. He went, kneeled down before God. God, why are you doing this kind of attitude towards your people? Did you bring them out of Egypt to kill them, to destroy them in the desert, so that the world will say that this God is not trustworthy God? Peter, similar kind of person, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus Christ. He did not fear anything. He took the sword and cut the ears of the soldiers. Jesus told, keep your sword in your sheath. Whoever takes this one, they will die like that. When his end time came, he loved Jesus so much. Jesus Christ was testing him. Do you love me? Simon, Peter, do you love me? Jesus told, I love, he said, I love you. Second time he asked her, he said that I love you. Third time when Jesus questioned her, he again asked her, testing his patience, he told that, I don't know, you know how much I love. Take care of my sheep. When he was dying, he was, you know, persecuted. And at the time of his death, his destiny also died on the cross, crucifixion. Then he requested, he had a final wish to ask the soldiers who are coming to, to you know, uh, crucify him. Then he told that I have one, one small request. What is the request? I don't want to be, you know, crucified, my heart up, but I want to be crucified upside down so that when I die, I can hug my, 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 my master's feet and I can die so peacefully. They are very rough people, but when they had an encounter with God, with their master, they came down, they're all you know, selfishness melted away. Then in the, that place, godliness came and they became powerful vessels in his hand. That is why you and me are sitting here and worshipping that living God. Paul, you know, I don't need to tell about Paul. <laughs> Very dangerous person. Very dangerous. When Stephen was stoning, stoned to death, he was praying to God. When he was seeing the vision, the God, Jesus is standing at the right side of Father. He prayed, Father, Jesus, don't count this thing. He was holding, approving the death, the stoning death of Stephen and holding the people's cloth who are directly involved, accusing and stoning and killing Stephen. And he's ready to take 
go to anywhere. He is ready to take any big, you know, you know, uh, big leaders of, you know, Jesus Christ or you know, Christian faith. He is ready. He can do that one. He did that one. But finally, just one word he heard from Jesus Christ. He asked, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? It's me, the God whom you are persecuting. Change the world. He changed, everything changed that encounter, that one encounter. At the end, he told, what can separate us from the love of God? Starvation, beating, flogging, shipwreck, death, nothing. That much confidence he had. So these are the situations we know that when we love God, how much he loves us. We get that confidence. That's why when, you know, when, when uh, God, uh, uh, when uh, Apostle Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ, he did not immediately, he took a, a few years of break, went to Arabia, sat there at the feet of Jesus Christ. He learned everything. He unlearned everything he learned, and he learned newly at the feet of Jesus Christ. Came back very powerfully. He got Jesus Christ used to him. That's why he could say that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Tell me, if somebody tell anything about our parents and our siblings, what you will do? What would be our percentage degree, zero to hundred? We will be zero degree, zero level. We'll attack them, right? If somebody says something about our own spouse and our own children, we won't leave them. We won't say, if somebody says something about our friends and our colleagues, we don't leave them. About our pastors and members, we don't leave them. Look at Jesus Christ. Now there is a possibility. When we hear anything about anybody, we have to look at the cross of Jesus Christ, the cross that represents redemption or a repossession. But Jesus Christ, look at him. Regardless of all this kind of pain, when the thief of thief who, are, who was on the cross of repentance, when he told her, remember me when you come in glory, he said that today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus knew that he is going there, but he knew that now this person will be accompanying him. And not only that, all these people, his own people, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, teachers of the law, the priests, high priests, leaders, common people, the, the, the political figures, the government officials, and all kind of people standing around Jesus and mocking at him. You know, they're just sending their you know, mockery on him. Jesus prayed one prayer. Otherwise, he knows Father will come down. He knows he will take revenge. Because, you know, he told the Babylon people to, when the, his children of Israel, when committed sin, he told that I'm going to bring my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. He told that he brought and destroyed and killed many people and saved a few people. And, but at the end, he told that uh, he did more than what I, I asked him to do. So I am going to turn against him now. He's going to raise another servant, King Cyrus, against him. And it just keep on going. Jesus knew exactly that father is going to come. But he doesn't want that to happen, his people to suffer. He prayed this prayer, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If that prayer was not there, it would have been a devastation in, in Jerusalem in those days. But he prayed, he stood there, even going through the severe pain in his body, in his soul, in his spirit, even though it's they, these people do not deserve it, he still prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We know that, you know, God forgive. But Jesus had every right to get upset with that one because he had a very hectic week 
10 days, you know. Since, ever since he came in the, the triumphal entry to Jerusalem on the, in the donkey to, uh, back, he, ever since he's very busy because he's preparing. He knows that very 10 days, less than 10 days he has. He has to take care of so many things. He has to settle down so many things. He has to educate his own disciples what they have to do, what they should not do, what they should do, all that he has to do. He was very busy, especially on the previous day, he was very busy. So many things. Just imagine. He told his disciples. He knows that this is the last day for him. He won't see next day morning because as a free man, he knew it. He told his disciples, go prepare the meal, the last supper. They went prepared. We are sitting in the table. He's sharing everything. And he revealed who is going to betray him. The, the betrayer is identified. And he told that, I am going to, I will, tonight I will strike the shepherd. When I read that portion from the book of Zachariah and Luke and all these you know, gospel writers quoted that one, I read it this way. I, the father, will strike the son, shepherd. Same person is going to, so that the sheep will be scattered. Then after the, after the supper, where did they go? They went to the Gethsemane to pray. He was in pain. He told disciples to sit here and pray. He took uh, Peter, James, and John. He went a little further. They told that you, you stay here and watch and pray. Let me go a little further and pray. When he went there, he had a very personal prayer with his father. He asked, Abba, Father, you can do everything. You can do everything. If possible, remove this cup from me. But not my will yet. Not my will, but your will be done. That's it. He, he doesn't want to force God too much to remove that cup. But he told that you can't do everything because you are the creator. You know everything that is going on. The pain that I am going through. All the situation I am going through. But I just want to let you know. If possible, remove this cup. But not yet, not my will. But let your will be done. Came back. Arrest. That whole night... They were try, doing trial in the in in in, in Sanhedrin before the Sanhedrin, the, the religious court. First they had a trial before you know um, Annas, the former high priest, and the, the current high priest, the ruling high priest, you know uh, Caiaphas. Morning, they couldn't because they cannot kill them. So they took him. To the pilot and all that, all the flogging, everything finished. Finally, they were sent, he was sentenced to death. When he was carrying on the towards that, it's a very painful situation for him. All the crowd is crying. They want somebody want to help, but they cannot help. And especially, you know, when he was carrying the cross, all the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, all that around him, because they don't want him to escape from this situation. We know that some of the uh, religious group believe that uh, Jesus escaped from, the, from that cross and he went away to Kashmir and lived uh, his rest of his life over there. How can they do this one? Because the scribe and Pharisees and all around him, and they made sure that he was, he was taken to Golgotha, he was crucified, Calvary, he was crucified, he was buried, and, and kept a big stone over there to cover the, you know, the tomb in the entrance, and they sealed it. How can they say that Jesus escaped? No, there's no way, because his own people are there to stop him. And in above all this, he has given us an opportunity to come to his presence, to call him up a father. Anytime he is ready to help us. And, and if he say that, uh, you know, it's very hard for a father to do that, but father has to do that one because that's the only way he can save us. That's why we are here, 21st century. <laughs> I want to conclude this one with these three points. One is the cross of redemption. In any life situation, we cannot partner with that people, such people, the cross of rebellion. And second group, the cross, the cross represents the cross of repentance. Always, anytime, 
Sorry, la. And the cross that Jesus hangs is the cross of redemption. I just want to read one testimony which happened or took place maybe uh, about 200 years ago in India. I just made a small small article for that in, a, in my spare personal note, not now before, but just I want to read that one. With that, I will conclude. <coughs> in the 1880s, there was a great revival in Wales, England. As a result, many missionaries traveled to many parts of the world. About the same time, many missionaries came to India also. One of the world's missionary came to the region called the present Assam, the state of Assam, and preached the gospel among the herd hunters. He had endured severe persecution. However, there was no converts at all. Finally, he saw his converts, his first converts in the brutal village. A husband and wife with their two children confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior and were baptized. Their village leaders decided to stop such activities in the village and decided to make an example of the husband. The village council ordered to arrest the younger family and ask them to renounce Christ. The council had demanded if the man did, did, did not renounce Christ, his wife and children will be murdered. But the man refused to renounce Jesus. His two children were shot by the archers before their parents. The second time he refused to renounce Christ, his wife was murdered in the same way. Again, the village council asked him to renounce Jesus, but he refused. He too met the same destiny of his wife and children. Later, the eyewitnesses narrated the younger incident to the world's the particular missionary. The village council ordered, they, he, they are narrating now, the village council ordered to arrest the family and ask the family to renounce Christ, but the man hesitated to renounce Christ by stating, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. The village council warned that the man will lose his wife and children when he refused by saying, the, whole, the world can be behind me, but the cross is still before me. His two children were murdered by the archers when the man refused again saying, though none go with me, still I will follow Jesus. His wife was killed in the same way. The man added, you take the whole world, but give me Jesus. He challenged the, the village council and told her, you take the whole world, my wife, my children, my possession, everything, but just give me Jesus. The village council saw, that the man was not willing to renounce Christ. They killed him also in the same way. Thus, the whole family together marched into glory. Later, world's missionary shared this with the, the famous, then the famous Indian evangelist Sadhu Sundar Singh. Sundar Singh took the martyrs' last words and put them into traditional Indian music and the song immediately became popular in Indian churches. Eventually, when some of the American missionaries returned to the Americas from India, and they brought that song with them here, eventually, one of the leading Canadian songwriter, George Beverly Shea, rewrote it, and he made it a staple at the Billy Graham Crusades, and it remains as a mainstay of worship music to this day. <laughs> this is one of the songs that challenged me in 1988 when I went first to study the Bible. And it, it took some time to understand. But even today, that song is still keeping me in faith to carry the gospel wherever. I know that. I was brutally beaten up four years ago in North India. When I requested for help, protection, security, they denied. They said that Jesus suffered. His disciples suffered. You are, we have to be like Jesus. One of the colleagues wrote to the, the president, we don't see a person like me 
like with Jesus attitude because where did I get that one because from this kind of you know missionaries challenges the person said you take my children my wife my possession everything but just give me Jesus with that let me conclude my words